I'd like to see an in-depth discussion of the morality and practicalities of redistributing stolen wealth which happened to be inherited after the theft. Don't forget that the UK's royals slaughtered their way to power, then enslaved a population of serfs so they could have literal golden thrones. Okay, let's give this a shot. Part 1. Introduction Hi all. This video is partly a response to some of the commenters on Sean's video titled Abolish the Monarchy. In the video, Sean explained that as well as abolishing the royal family, he favours nationalising the crown estate. He briefly explained that he sees the monarchy's property as illegitimate because it was inherited from brutal ancestors who acquired it violently. Most of the feedback for Sean's video was positive. However, there were also a lot of concerns expressed about expropriating the crown estate, including from people that seem to be left liberal fans of Sean. These are people that oppose racism and sexism, but are fine with violently derived concentrations of control over resources. For example, Vincent Moorbucks wrote, I'm sorry Sean, I'm a big fan of yours, but I have to disagree with you on a major point of your argument. You're saying the property of the royal family isn't theirs, because they personally did not purchase or acquire it, but rather inherited it. But do you really want to set the precedent that estates cannot keep holdings? Average T wrote, The part where I didn't agree with you is where you say that you should just nationalise the crown lands. What would give the government the right to do that? He adds, Loving the channel though. Some of the comments didn't reject the idea of expropriation but expressed an interest in the relevant questions being explored more deeply. For example, Pavarotti Aardvark wrote, So, I know we're limited by the nature of the format, but I can't help but feel that Sean is skipping a couple of rhetorical steps here. I'd like to see an in-depth discussion of the morality and practicalities of redistributing inherited wealth. Ben R replied with the comment I introduced the video with, asking for a discussion of the morality and practicalities of redistributing specifically violently acquired wealth. I think Ben's comment is actually very important to address, because as discussed in my last video, upholding violently derived property titles, particularly in land, contributes to much of the poverty and exploitation we see in the world today, particularly in ex-colonies. So my plan in this video is to ask, whether the traditional justifications put forward for private property since the Enlightenment period, particularly the justifications associated with John Locke and David Hume respectively, actually work when it comes to property with a violent past. And if they don't work, what are the implications? These questions are not often addressed in mainstream or even radical discourse as far as I'm aware. And when they are addressed, they're not addressed very thoroughly so hopefully this video will spark further interest around the questions. Note that this video is concerned with all property with a violent past, not just the Crown Estate. Therefore, if it can be shown that the traditional justifications for private property don't work for violently derived property, then this could have some significant implications, because a lot of property in the world derives from violence. Part 2. Private Property to start with, I want to clarify what I mean by private property. I'm going to define private property as something that a person has full ownership over. Property theorists Valentine, Steiner and Atsuka have explained that full ownership entails the following five rights. 1. Control rights over the use of the object. 2. Rights to compensation if someone uses the object without one's permission. 3. Enforcement rights to prevent the violation of these rights or to extract compensation owed for past violation. 4. Rights to transfer these rights to others by sale, rental, gift or loan. And 5. Immunity to the non-consensual loss of any of the rights of ownership. We can compare private property to other forms of resource control. For example, we can compare it to mutualist possession rights. In Europe, Mutualist type ideas go back to at least St. Thomas Aquinas, and some Native American societies had mutualist type systems. Under mutualism, one cannot fully own items such as land, rather, one can only possess them. Under mutualism, you can have control rights over your home and its back garden, for example. However, 
After abandoning those possessions, after some socially agreed period of time, people lose possession rights and new users and occupiers gain control rights. Therefore, under mutualism, people would still have autonomous control over the items they use, but by and large, they wouldn't have the right to extract rents and profits through absentee landlord and capitalist property titles. So what are the traditional justifications for private property? I think it's reasonable to say that there are two main broad types of justifications which have been used since the Enlightenment. Firstly, there is a Lockean natural rights justification, going back to John Locke. Secondly, there is utilitarian economics justification, which traces back to at least David Hume. Let's briefly look at what I mean by Lockeanism and utilitarian economics before looking at how these ideas are used to defend existing property titles. Let's start by outlining Lockeanism. Part 3. Lockeanism Lockeanism was first laid out by the 17th century philosopher John Locke, hence the name. Locke is often considered the founder of liberalism, famously arguing that government should be limited to protecting people's life, liberty and property. Let's have a look at his ideas on property rights. Locke argued that we have natural rights to own our bodies and our labour. By labouring on resources, we join the labour we own with those resources. By joining what we own with unowned resources, we come to own the resources. The ideas might seem a bit strange, but they perhaps sound more reasonable when we look at alternative ways that the theory is framed. The Lockean approach is sometimes known as the homestead principle, with those who labour on unowned resources being considered the homesteaders and legitimate owners. Here's a Yale professor enthusiastically expressing the idea. And then this is a beautiful citation, I just love it, right? Uh, Though the water running in the fountain be everyone's, yet who can doubt but that in the pitcher is his only who drew it out. Bingo, right? How crisply in one sentence, right, he can capture this wonderful idea. The basic idea is that those that have laboured deserve to keep the fruits of their labour and they deserve to keep those fruits in a particular form, private property rights, rather than mutualist possession rights, for example. According to Lockeanism, apart from homesteading property, the only legitimate way to acquire property is through voluntary transfer from a legitimate owner, with legitimate ownership tracing back to homesteading. Meanwhile, any aggression against persons or their property is an infringement on natural rights. Now, to save time, here we won't go into the variations of the Lockean argument, nor will I go into all the possible counter-arguments. I will say that I think Lockean arguments are extremely weak for a number of reasons, some of which might jump out at a lot of people, and I'd like to do at least one video giving an overview of these weaknesses. However, for this video, when it comes to Lockeanism, I'll only be looking at how the theory deals with the problem of violently derived holdings. Part 4. Utilitarian Economics Now let's look at the utilitarian economics argument for private property. This argument goes back to at least David Hume. Writing in the 18th century, Hume rejected Locke's natural law approach to justice, comparing natural law ideas to superstitions. Instead of there being natural law, Hume argued that providing public utility is the sole purpose of the law. Hume did defend private property, but argued that rather than there being natural rights to property, the real reason for private property systems is that they are socially useful. Specifically, he argued that private property systems work better at dealing with the problem of resource scarcity than a system of holding all things in common. He argued that if we lived in a Garden of Eden with complete abundance, then everything could be held in common. But as we have scarcity and need to engage in productive labour to survive and flourish, a private property system is useful. The utilitarian Jeremy Bentham agreed with these ideas and built on them. In the tradition of Hume and Bentham, utilitarian advocates of private property, sometimes labelled utilitarian economists, 
point out that private property systems allow people to use scarce resources to pursue their own individual ends. These ends may be anything from playing sports, to pursuing a religious life, to producing radical literature. Whatever they are, private property enables people to pursue those ends, and the more people are able to pursue their own ends, the better off society will be. It is also argued that private property, including in the form of money, allows for efficient allocation of resources, as people can trade things they own for things they'd prefer. Furthermore, private property systems facilitate and incentivize productive use of resources and profitable investment, which improve overall well-being. As with Lockeanism, I won't be giving a general critique of utilitarian economist ideas. Instead, I'll just look at how utilitarian economics responds to the problem of violently derived holdings. Part 5. Examples of Lockean and Utilitarian Economics Claims Okay, having laid out the two main schools of thought which promote private property, let's have a look at how the ideas are used to defend existing property titles. These defences are often made in response to concerns about the concentration of wealth in the hands of the rich. A common Lockean defence goes something like, the rich deserve to own what they do because of the labour they have done. Here are a couple of clips. It is true that people make it to the top in this country. They do work really hard. They do take a lot of risks. They do start businesses. Uh, and they make real sacrifices to get to the top. If you look at a guy like Jeff Bezos, for instance, that Amazon guy is worth more money than anybody ever, right? That guy works all day. Yeah, they just work all the time. It is also claimed that interfering with people's private property is an infringement on natural rights and freedoms. You have a right to your life and you have a right to your property, but you don't have a, 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 an education isn't a right. Medical care is not a right. Education, uh, these, these are things that you have to earn. Currently Answer living, the question. I'm forced to, wait, what? what was You're okay with me having five houses and six yachts? Uh, I'm not okay with you having them as if you are not using them. Oh, not you. So all of a sudden you're now telling me how to live my life. I'm never going to tell you how to live your life, my friend. Why are you telling me how to live mine? A utilitarian economics defense is that those with huge amounts of private property provide a socially useful function by investing in capitalist enterprises. Such investment spreads wealth in the form of wages and improves living standards by producing an abundance of consumer goods. Uh, why is it we have so many uh, millionaires and everything in the United States and we still have so many impoverished people who try to get up into the world? Why is it we have this lack of money where people who can't support themselves decently and get a decent job where all these big men are up on top making oodles and oodles of money? They don't need it. They can only eat that much, eat in a sleep in the bed. And what do you suppose bed. they do it? If they don't eat it and don't, sli uh, don't use it, what do you suppose they, they do They hoard it. They and what do you mean they hoard it? You mean it? they put it under their pillows? That's right. No. They, they keep investing it. Investing it in That's what? That's right. Yeah. What are they invested in? Well, in oil and everything where, I mean, all these other people who what are What are they invested in? Don't get off the subject. No. What are they invested in? Well, they invested in a lot of uh, different things that the little people need. Well, do they invest it in factories? Yes. Does some of that money end up in machines? Yes. Do those factories and machines provide ordinary working people with jobs or not? What do you suppose the productivity of this country would be and of the, uh, the wage rate would be if the total amount of capital in this country today was what it was a hundred years ago? Where do you suppose the improvements in productivity come from except from the, re the investment by people of their savings? What spurs the economy is the creation of new products and services, and that is only going to be done by people who have exp expendable capital to actually invest in the new products and services that we all enjoy. This is what creates economic growth. Another version of this argument is the mainstream argument for so-called free markets. Now, not all proponents of free markets are defenders of existing property titles. As discussed in the book Markets Not Capitalism, there are anti-capitalist proponents of free markets that support private property rights but think a genuine free market requires significant property redistribution to respond to historical injustice. There are also those who oppose private property but favour free markets based on mutualist possession rights. However, when defenders of the status quo refer to free markets, 
They mean maintaining the existing concentration of private property titles, which are largely, or perhaps completely, violently derived, and then more or less letting people do what they want with those titles. Although in fairness, it's possible some of them don't even realise that this is what they mean. If you're for the poor, if you're actually concerned that the poorest people in the world rise above their starvation levels, then the, all the evidence suggests that the best way to do that is to implement something approximating a free market economy. And so, thank you very much. We should never forget the immense value and potential of an open, innovative, free market economy. With these points in mind, I think that whilst the defences of existing private property titles come in different forms and are presented in different ways, in essence, they all seem to be either Lockean or utilitarian economics claims. Now let's discuss how Lockeanism and utilitarian economics deal with the problem of property derived from violence. If it is the case that these types of defences of private property don't work when it comes to property with a violent past, then they can be said to only really apply to property in a hypothetical world, and not our actual world, which is largely made up of violently derived property. Part 6. Lockeanism and violently derived property. Let's start by looking at how Lockean's responds to the problem. We must start here by noting that Locke himself avoided addressing the problem. Instead, he repeatedly implied, despite the historical record, that property allocations in the world had actually emerged in the way that he saw as just, through homesteaders in a state of nature labouring on land and then trading with each other until contemporary property allocations had arisen. For example, in the last section of his discussion on justice in property, he wrote, I think it is very easy to conceive, without any difficulty, how labour could at first begin a title of property in the common things of nature, and how the spending it upon our uses bounded it, so that there could then be no reason of quarrelling about title, nor any doubt about the largeness of possession it gave. Right and conveniency went together. I won't speculate here as to why John Locke, a court intellectual on the payroll of the Earl of Shaftesbury, would have avoided discussing the problem of the incompatibility of crown and aristocratic property rights with his stated ideas on justice. Instead, I'll outline what I think a reasonable approach for him to have taken would have been. Part 7. A Lockean Law of Restitution Here it must be acknowledged that when Locke was writing, there was already a well-established body of theory for addressing injustice in holdings. This is a body of theory we still have today. It is known as the Law of Restitution. This law developed in Middle Ages Europe, but there are similar laws that trace back to ancient societies in many parts of the world. As the Oxford jurist Graham Virgo has explained, the aim of the Law of Restitution is to deprive persons of unjust gains. For example, those in possession of stolen goods owe those goods in restitution to the theft victim, or those who have exploited vulnerable persons for a gain owe those gains in restitution. It is also worth noting that significantly, restitution was promoted by the foundational natural law theorist St. Thomas Aquinas as the tool for addressing injustice in holdings, dedicating a whole chapter of his book, Summa Theologica, to the topic. This was in the 13th century, over 400 years before Locke was writing. As a natural law theorist himself, it would have been reasonable for Locke to say that restitution is the correct tool for addressing historical injustice. He could have outlined a Lockean version of the law of restitution, which entails depriving people of all forms of property gained outside of Lockean justice. Later in the video we'll look at some implications of enacting a Lockean law of restitution. However, first I want to note that two influential modern Lockean theorists, Robert Nozick, the award-winning ex-Harvard professor, and Murray Rothbard, the inventor of so-called anarcho-capitalism, have each offered alternative Lockean approaches to the problem of violently acquired holdings. Let us consider these in turn, starting with Nozick's. Part 8. Nozick's Rectification Principle Nozick argued for what he referred to as the rectification principle. According to this principle, attempts must be made to make people as well off as they would have been had historical injustice not taken place. Nozick suggested that ideally 
all historical injustice suffered by persons, including injustice to one's ancestors and injustice by governments as well as individuals, should be taken into account when considering how well off persons could have otherwise been. Lacking the historical information to do this, Nozick suggested that redistribution from the best off in society towards the worst off, for example welfare, may be justified to address historical injustice if it is assumed that the best off in society have disproportionately benefited from injustice and that the worst off have been disproportionately harmed. However, Nozick offered little detail on how much redistribution would be justified, although he specified that transitioning to some form of socialism would be to go too far. The bourgeois economist Robert E. Litan has further discussed the implications of Nozick's approach. According to Litan, the mathematical formula likely to bring us closest to rectifying past injustice in line with Nozick's approach and getting us closest to a just distribution of holdings is to give each person the mean average of the possible holdings they could have gotten without injustice taking place. Due to the fact we can never gain a good understanding of all the relevant injustices that have historically taken place, Litan suggests that we cannot say that people have different distributions of possible ideal holdings. Thus, according to Nozick's approach, we should treat everybody in a given society as having the same possible holdings. Litan explains that this would actually require attempting to equalise all property holdings between members of the society in question. Now, I personally don't have a problem with this conclusion, and I think the Lockean law of restitution comes up with the same result. However, this Nozick Litan approach is clearly extremely problematic from a Lockean perspective. According to Lockeanism, you can't take justly held property from people. You can only take identifiably unjustly held property from people. The Nozick Litan approach ignores this rule and doesn't specify that it is only property that was gained through an identifiable injustice that should be redistributed. Hence this approach is generally ignored by Lockean theorists. However, the Lockean law of restitution doesn't suffer from this problem as it only works to confiscate holdings gained through identifiable injustices. Therefore it can't be ignored by consistent Lockeans. Part 9. Rothbard's Innocent Homesteader Scheme I call Rothbard's approach the Innocent Homesteader Scheme and it is popular in right libertarian circles. According to Rothbard, the first non-thief to use a stolen item should be considered the legitimate owner unless a victim or victim's heir can be found. Rothbard argued that when there are no identifiable victims of historical theft, then the stolen property should be considered to have become unowned, so that when it is laboured on again, it should be considered to come under the legitimate ownership of the new homesteader. For example, if somebody owns a stolen watch, if the victims or their heirs can't be found, it can be assumed that the watch wearer is the first person to use or homestead the unowned watch, and is hence the legitimate owner. This is unless the wearer of the watch is proven to be the thief, in which case the watch should go to the next user. In this way, Rothbard thought all property would end up staying with its current owner, unless it could be shown that a theft victim or victim's heir was owed the property. Now, to save time, here I won't go into a full critique of Rothbard's approach to this subject. I'll just focus on what I think is the biggest problem with it. This is a problem which I think makes Rothbard's approach pretty clearly incompatible with Lockean theory, and therefore means that it should be disregarded by Lockeans that want to be intellectually consistent. The problem is that it overlooks the victims of the Lockean crime of monopoly. This crime is the Lockean version of the injustice Aquinas outlined of unjustly preventing people from acquiring what they otherwise would have had. Let us discuss this crime and the implications it has for addressing historical injustice from a Lockean perspective. As Rothbard discussed, one form of monopoly is when someone unjustly prevents another person from homesteading unowned natural resources. Rothbard asked us to imagine that Crusoe is on an island. If Crusoe were to claim the whole island as his own, even parts which Crusoe himself has not used and homesteaded, and he tried to exclude Friday from joining him on the island, 
Crusoe would be illegitimately aggressing against Friday. In this context, Rothbard also criticised what he referred to as Columbus Complex, whereby people claim monopoly ownership over whole islands they discover upon arrival, including lands they have not laboured on. Now, this form of monopoly is not addressed in English restitution law. This is presumably because it would mainly apply to the monarchy's historical land monopoly, dating back to 1066, when all land, including unused land, was taken over by the crown. Whilst English law overlooks this form of monopoly, as we will discuss, a Lockean law of restitution would address it. A second form of monopoly is exercising monopoly ownership over stolen items. A monopolist over stolen items might be a person who buys, or in some other way comes into possession of, stolen goods. However, the monopolist also might be the thief, who maintains possession of the item they stole. Whilst possessing stolen items is considered criminal under English law, this law is not applied to historically stolen land, as this historical land theft is not recognised as a crime. A lucky in law of restitution would not overlook this historical land theft. To see the difference between the Lockean law of restitution, which can address monopoly, and Rothbard's scheme, which can't, let us imagine a simple scenario with some similarity to actual historical events in many countries. Let us imagine that Norman takes land from Smith, and then Smith soon dies, leaving no heirs. Let us then imagine that Norman advertises that the land is for sale. The land will be sold to the highest bidder. All of the local villagers want a piece of the land, but are prevented from homesteading it by Norman's criminal ownership. Some locals make bids for the land, but are rejected. Other locals want the land, but don't make a bid, as they think their bid won't be successful. In the end, only one farmer, Johnson, is given the land by Norman, as he makes the highest bid. We can notice that after stealing the land from Smith, the second crime Norman committed here was monopoly. He was committing monopoly when he prevented Smith accessing his land, and continued his monopoly aggression by excluding other people from homesteading the land after Smith's death. Norman was not entitled to prevent other people from homesteading the land, as he was not a legitimate owner. According to the Lockean law of restitution, the victims of monopoly, that is, those who were unjustly barred by Norman from the land, whilst Norman looked for the highest bidding buyer, became owed the land in restitution. However, according to Rothbard's scheme, Johnson should be considered the rightful owner of Smith's sold land. The monopoly victims are ignored. I therefore think the Lockean law of restitution is clearly more compatible with Lockean theory than Rothbard's approach. Part 10. Enacting Lockean restitution for monopoly. Now, there are practical questions that arise when addressing monopoly with Lockean restitution. How do we judge who became owed Smith's sold land? Here we should recall that as restitution theorists, since at least Aquinas have pointed out, restitution requires an attempt to make holdings as close to what they would have been had an injustice not taken place. If this is the case, then when making judgments on restitution for monopoly, we should attempt to estimate who would have homesteaded what had it not been for the monopolist's aggression. This is similar to the common practice of estimating losses in cases where compensation is required for road traffic accidents and the like. If it is unclear who would have homesteaded Smith's old land, it may be the case that the closest neighbours of Smith should divide the land equally amongst themselves. However, in the case that it is entirely unclear who was most likely to have homesteaded Smith's old land, where it's not for Norman's monopoly, the land should be divided equally amongst all members of the affected society, because strictly speaking, they were all unjustly barred from homesteading the monopolised holding. Three clarifications must be made here. Firstly, the claims of the villagers or anyone else owed Smith's old land in restitution have priority over the claim of Norman's customer, Johnson. If Johnson refuses to give them the land in restitution, he becomes a monopolist himself. Johnson would be committing monopoly aggression against the people owed the land. Note that in the case that it is unclear who is owed the land in restitution, 
he would be committing monopoly aggression against everybody in the society in question, as they would all be owed a share of the land in restitution. Note also that if everybody in the society was owed the land in restitution, new victims would be continuously generated, as people would be born and grow up, and would all be unjustly barred by Johnson from homesteading the land, or receiving the land from a legitimate homesteader. Furthermore, if Johnson were to ignore the victims of Monopoly, and transfer the land to a third party, such as Johnson Jr., this third party would now be a monopolist. The same goes if Johnson Jr. transferred the land to another person. We see that in this way, once a holding becomes monopolised, hence owed in restitution, it remains monopolised, and can never be considered justly held again until it has gone through a restitutionary process. No person that is gifted monopolised property, or buys, rents, or steals it, can be considered the legitimate owner. Monopolised property remains owed in restitution until it has gone through a restitution process. Note here that due to 1. The global history of feudal, colonial and state land monopoly and 2. The fact that no land in the world has ever gone through a lock-in restitution process. It is possible that all existing land ownership in our actual world is illegitimate according to the lock-in law of restitution. The second clarification we must make is that if all unjustly gained items must go through a restitution process to become justly held, then all items produced from unjustly held land and natural resources are also unjustly held until those items go through a restitution process. To see this we can turn to Kinsella's argument that creating useful new items is not a necessary or sufficient condition for coming to own them. Rather, whether one legitimately owns an item one creates depends on whether one legitimately owns the resources one uses in order to produce the item. This argument can be seen partly as a retort to Rothbard's claim that sculptors should own the sculptures they make. According to Kinsella, one cannot create some possibly disputed scarce resource without first using the raw materials used to create the item. But these raw materials are scarce, and either I own them or I do not. If not, then I do not own the resulting product. If I own the inputs, then by virtue of such ownership, I own the resulting thing into which I transform them. Consider the forging of a sword. If I own some raw metal, because I mined it from the ground I owned, then I own the same metal after I've shaped it into a sword. I do not need to rely on the fact of creation to own the sword, but only on my ownership of the factors used to make the sword. And I do not need creation to come to own the factors, since I can homestead them by simply mining them from the ground, and thereby becoming the first possessor. On the other hand, if I fashion a sword using your metal, I do not own the resulting sword. In fact, I may owe you damages for trespass or conversion. Creation, therefore, is neither necessary nor sufficient to establish ownership. By extension, if the sword maker makes a sword from metal owed in restitution to other people, then the sword is owed in restitution to those that were owed the metal. Furthermore, if the sword maker then transfers that sword to someone else, the recipient does not become the just owner of the sword. The recipient now owns the sword in restitution to the people that were owed the metal. We must therefore conclude that all items ever made from unjustly held natural resources are themselves unjustly held and owed in restitution. This probably delegitimizes ownership over most items in the world. For example, since all land in England has been unjustly held, hence owed in restitution, since at least 1066, so are all the items which have been made from the resources that come out of English land. The third clarification that must be made is in reference to the fact that earlier, when I said that Smith's stolen land should be redistributed equally amongst all members of the society, it was not entirely clear which society I meant. The whole village? The country? The world? Who decides? I personally think, in lieu of good reasons otherwise, all unjustly held items with entirely unknown rightful owners should be distributed 
in an egalitarian manner amongst all people in the world. Any other cut-off point seems ethically arbitrary. In this way, such items could be said to become part of the global commons. However, note that under Lockeanism, the property should technically remain under the ownership of individuals as private property. This could be achieved by all people in the world gaining equal shares in the property, and it could be managed like a joint stock company or a cooperative. There remain questions over the practicalities of how the property could be managed, but this would have to be decided democratically by the owners. This said, I'll make a few brief suggestions. Firstly, I think Eleanor Ostrom's book, Governing the Commons, provides theoretical tools and historical case studies useful for thinking about how to manage common pool resources. Secondly, let us assume for the moment that due to the global history of feudal, colonial and state monopoly over resources, all items in the world are held unjustly and owed in lock in restitution. Let us also assume that it is also unclear who would own what were it not for this history, so everything must become part of the commons. In this scenario, I think moving to some form of mutualist type market system might be a good way to initially implement Ostrom's ideas. I'll outline a few possible features of such a system. 1. Housing could come under the rent and mortgage free possession of the occupiers. Thus, for example, if homeless people occupied empty houses, they'd become the just possessors. 2. Debts could be wiped clean. 3. Natural resources, including land, could come under democratic community control. 4. Key infrastructure, services, and utilities could be managed democratically in a manner somewhat similar to how normal nationalised industries currently are, although free from the interests of capital. This might mean, for example, that this key industry sector could provide a guaranteed, well paid job to all people. 5. Large businesses which are not essential to the economy could be taken over by workers and made accountable to community organisations. 6. Small businesses could be turned into co ops or remain under the possession of small business persons, depending on the circumstances. Note that the small business sector would presumably flourish as people would generally be better off and have more time and resources to invest in their own enterprises. Note also that this is just one possible outline for managing the economy, and the details would differ from place to place depending on local needs and preferences. Part 11. Utilitarian Economics and Violently Derived Property Now let us move on to discussing how utilitarian economists deal with the problem of property which derives from violent acquisition. Neither Hume nor Bentham address this question directly as far as I'm aware. However, the influential 20th century utilitarian economist Ludwig van Mises did address it. Mises acknowledged that all existing property titles in the world seem to derive from violence. He saw property law as emerging when members of society recognise that it is in their interest to respect the violently imposed property titles of the powerful. However, he rejected the idea that this should delegitimize existing property titles. Mises pointed out that to respond to historical violence would be to assume that there is an eternal notion of justice which can be applied to the past, an idea Mises rejected as utilitarian. Rather, he suggested that existing property law should be appreciated for putting an end to the natural state of affairs, which is a war of all against all. The problem with this argument when it comes to defending existing property titles has been outlined by Mises' usually loyal student, Murray Rothbard, who we discussed earlier. Rothbard wrote, The utilitarian who has no conception, let alone theory of justice, must fall back on the pragmatic, ad hoc view that all titles to private property currently existing, at any time or place, must be treated as valid and accepted as worthy of defence against violation. This, in fact, is the way utilitarian free market economists invariably treat the question of property rights. Note, however, that the utilitarian has managed to smuggle into his discussion an unexamined ethic, that all goods now, the time and place at which the discussion occurs, 
considered private property must be accepted and defended as such. In practice, this means that all private property titles designated by any existing government, which has everywhere seized the monopoly of defining titles to property, must be accepted as such. Now, whilst I don't think Rothbard had a leg to stand on when it came to his own innocent homesteader scheme, I do think that he was correct in his assessment of Mises' approach to justice in property. Mises would seemingly be committed to saying that utilitarians cannot ethically object to property rights decisions of governments, whether or not they uphold property rights derived from violence. At the moment, violently derived titles cannot be objected to. However, if a government decided to redistribute violently derived property, by Mises' logic, the new titles could also not be ethically objected to. Now, whilst utilitarian economists don't favour redistribution of violently derived property as a way of addressing historical injustice, I think they should favour such redistribution for another reason. To see why, recall that earlier we saw that one reason utilitarians defend private property is because it allows people to pursue their individual ends. This would imply that the more people who have a significant amount of property, then the better off the society will be as a whole. Indeed, Bentham wrote, the more extensively property is distributed, the more happiness does it produce. He further concluded that the closer wealth distribution came to equality, the greater overall happiness would be. This makes sense if we consider that redistributing housing alone could address homelessness and result in most people not having to spend a large portion of their income on rent or mortgages. Now, Bentham opposed the idea that the government should redistribute property, as this would undermine security and property, which he saw as more important than equality. He argued that if people don't have security of ownership in what they produce, then people will cease to be productive and society will suffer as a whole. Instead, he hoped that equality would come about through market mechanisms. However, his argument against redistribution seems not to apply to restitution for historical injustice, because this form of redistribution would not threaten the future security of property rights. Restitution would entail only one unique instance of redistribution to respond to historical injustice, and after this one instance, property rights could remain secure in the way Bentham favoured. Therefore, it seems to me that the utilitarian argument against redistribution does not work when it comes to restitution. Thus it seems utilitarian economists should support restitution as it should make most people better off, which is what utilitarian economists are supposed to favour. At the very least, it seems very problematic for utilitarian economists to oppose restitution. Now, earlier, I suggested that restitution could entail all property becoming part of the common, and then being managed according to mutualist ideas. Utilitarian economics doctrine would seemingly oppose this, as it is concerned with property being managed in the traditional way. But this doctrine could be taken into account whilst still achieving mass redistribution of resources. An egalitarian housing project could be enacted, so that as many people as possible got rent and mortgage-free homes. Debts could still be wiped out. Everybody in each country could get shares in major firms central to the economy, and these firms could be managed democratically by the owners. The same goes for natural resources, including land. Medium and small-sized firms could be turned into worker or community cooperatives. From there, private property could function as usual. Part 12 Recap and concluding remarks. Okay, this brings us towards the end of the video. Let's recap what we found. Firstly, we noted that there are two broad approaches to defending private property lucky and natural rights arguments and utilitarian economics arguments. We first looked at how Lockeanism deals with violently derived property. We suggested that a Lockean version of the law of restitution is the correct way to approach the problem if one accepts Lockeanism. According to this law, we have argued that all historically stolen or monopolised items should be considered unjustly held and should go through an egalitarian restitution process, although what exactly this restitution process should look like 
is something to be worked out democratically, possibly building on the work of Eleanor Ostrom. We then looked at the utilitarian economics approach to property with a violent history. Firstly, we argued that if a government enacts redistribution, utilitarian economists cannot ethically object. Secondly, it appears that utilitarian economists should favour redistribution in the form of restitution. This is because utilitarian economics tends to favour equally distributed property as long as this comes about in a way which does not pose a threat to the future security of property titles. Therefore, redistributing property due to historical theft and monopoly would seem to be an acceptable reason to redistribute property according to utilitarian economics, as redistribution for this reason does not threaten further future expropriation. With these points in mind, I think the Lockean and utilitarian economics ideas that are usually appealed to to support existing property titles actually entail mass property redistribution. Now, I'd like to make a few further points in conclusion. Firstly, I suggested that according to the Lockean law of restitution, all items in the world may be unjustly held. This would take further assessment of the historical record to confirm. Secondly, I'd like to reiterate points that I made earlier. I find both the Lockean and utilitarian economics arguments for private property to be extremely weak and I'd like to discuss this further in future videos. Finally, I've opened Patreon and PayPal accounts for people that would like to support this channel. Thanks for watching, see you soon.